So I want to start with your view on what is the big story, big headline of the day, where the Prime Minister has holed up states who aren't cutting VAT on uh, you know petrol and diesel, saying that, hey, we at the central government have cut excise, but these seven states, which are opposition-run states, haven't cut VAT. It's become a political issue. Would you agree that at the basis of all of this is the concern of how further hikes in petrol diesel prices are going to contribute even more to inflation worries? Well, I would agree that the prices right now are not by any means the peak. The global price is like something like $105 per barrel. Uh, if this Ukraine war continues, I see the price of oil going up to 110, 50, 115, 120, 130. So, you know, while there is a current problem, this problem is soon going to be overtaken by even worse problems. So the issue is not just, you know, at this point of time, how do you share the burden between center and states? It would have more and more is going to have to be borne as we look forward in the next six or seven months, uh, assuming that the war and sanctions continue. So all I can say is that, you know, in politics, every party likes to put the blame on the other side. So at this point of time, if both sides actually need to do something, uh, instead of just finger pointing, the center needs to do cut duties modestly, not very large. The state governments need to do something similar. And even at the end of it all, you will have to live with higher prices. Let us not pretend that there is something happening which is entirely the fault of either Mr. Modi or the states. The problem is a global one. If the whole globe cannot escape it, India cannot escape it either. All you can do is there can be a palliative. So we can have a certain amount of burden sharing between the center and the states. Both will have to do something. But at the end of it all, there will have to be a very large increase in oil prices if the world price goes up to $130 a barrel, which in my view is very likely. So, you know, these are very tough things. It is not within the power of the central government or the state governments to solve this. This is a typhoon coming globally from outside. Secondly, please remember, it's not just oil. In the United States, for instance, right now, they have a record inflation of 8.5%. But even if you strip out food and fuel, the other inflation is 6.5% against the norm of 2%. So there is a huge global inflation factor hitting the whole world. We cannot escape it. All that we can say is, how do we adjust? And partly we can adjust, for instance, by some cutting of duties on oil. You can adjust partly by saying, let us continue with free food, food rations for another six, eight months. And beyond that, you have to tighten our loins and said, let us hope this particular uh, dreary episode gets over. Let's hope the war in Ukraine get, comes to some kind of ceasefire or some kind of end. Let the world inflation come down. If the world remains highly inflationary, India cannot become an uh, island of stability. We will be go pulled up and down. So we do need an entire world uh, anti-inflation move. The Fed is doing something. The European Central Bank is going to do something. The world over, some steps are being done to rein in inflation. So they will be as important, along with the Ukraine war, as anything that we can do. It is not entirely within our hands right now. So just as, you know, me measures of what can be done against the gale force of inflation, one um, very quick tool uh, that policymakers use is hiking interest rates. Do you think that in our context, the Apex Bank, the Reserve Bank of India, has been sluggish in hiking interest rates? Was it a right move to continue to boost growth even as this inflation uh, fear was looming? And how do you think the response will be going further down? It's an interesting question. You see, what's very clear is that if you look at the European Central Bank or the Fed, everybody now agrees that those guys loused up they should have started raising interest rates much earlier. Instead, they first said, <clears throat> oh no, there's a temporary problem caused by COVID. Then there's a temporary problem caused by some supply uh, chain breaking up. And now, you know, this Ukraine war has come. It's very clear that they underestimated the underlying trends. Because even if you strip out uh, food and fuel, the balance of inflation is very high. So those countries are going to be raising interest rates very substantially in the next 12 months. 
Then the question is, should the Reserve Bank follow suit? I would say within the Indian context, we can afford to worry more about growth than prices. The truth is that we on our own are not going to be able to control prices. The global inflation is going to come in almost regardless of what you do. So it is not the case that by sharply raising Indian interest rates, we will be able to tame Indian inflation when the main problem is a global one. So I think the RBI will have to raise interest rates, but it should do so gradually. And I think the RBI is right to say that on our own, if you just raise interest rates very high, you will squeeze production without solving the problem of imported inflation. So let us not go overboard on raising interest rates. Let it be more gradual than what is being contemplated in the USA. How do we cushion the poorest of the poor? Uh, when we talk about inflation, we talk about mehengai, it uh, you know often becomes a political headline, a political slogan. But the fact is that the poorest of the poor will suffer the most. Will that be and should that be the priority of governance right now to cushion the weakest? You know, if you continue, as I'm proposing, with free food rations, I mean, that is a huge, uh, huge, huge gain. There are various studies, including the latest one by Sujit Bhalla, Arvind Virmani and others, showing that because of the impact of free food, the actual consumption levels, the actual income levels, effective income levels have risen tremendously despite the travails of COVID. So if you are able to meet this basic food requirement of all the poor people, you have already done a huge amount to take care of the fact that other items are going up in price. So I would say that is a very major plus. Uh, it has been a very positive in the last uh, one and a half years, and that should be continued. So that is one of the things that is within our control. So free food can be continued. Some cuts in oil excise duties can be done. And those two put together, we will then say, okay, there is some protection for the poor. Beyond this, we cannot solve the problem of a global storm. But these are necessary steps and they will be very, very substantially uh, good palliatives. Very infamously, it was uh, said last year that inflation is probably transitory. Now that... That has been thrown out of the window. But what is your take? How long are we in for this Tommy Seas? If there is a, a quick end to the war in Russia and Ukraine, we don't have another surge of COVID numbers around the world. Do you think we could see things going back to earlier levels fairly quickly? Or are we in for a longer, bumpier ride? It could appear that we are in for a longer thing. Uh, if you see across the world, I mean, uh, you can say Ukraine war affected oil or it affected maize or uh, sunflower oil areas where Ukraine is a very big exporter. But if you look at the world across the price of cotton, the price of steel, the price of aluminium, uh, the price of plastics, the price of everything is going up. So, I mean, there are people who talk about a multi-commodity cycle or even something called a condrity of cycle. These are long cycles over a very large number of years caused by basic technical technological change. And there is a case for saying that right now, perhaps we are at the start of one of those cycles. And in those one of those cycles, these commodity prices are going to be rising quite substantially for quite some time, regardless of what you do. And one of the reasons again would be that the world has underestimated the demand for all these commodities for so long that there has been gross underinvestment. Certainly, there has been such a green outcry against oil and against coal that there has been gross underinvestment in those areas and the chickens are coming home to roost. So if you want to be greener, you can be greener, but the object of that greenery is to make fuels very, very expensive so that consumption comes down. So you cannot have it both ways. You cannot on the one hand say, let me be more green and let me say, let us have price stability. They contradict each other. So what is happening right now, I think, is that there is a huge global multi-commodity price cycle pushing everything up. These things will not be solved very easily because I cannot bring new copper mines or new aluminium mines on stream very, very quickly. Yes. And with the number of green concerns that we have, the amount, number of years it takes to get a new license is quite substantial. So the producers are unable to react very quickly to shortages. It takes some time. So I regret to say that I fear that this inflation is going to be with us for quite some time, 
even if COVID doesn't re uh, reappear, even if the Ukraine war comes to a reasonably close end, I do not think we are going to be free of inflation. Last question, sir. What does inflation mean in real terms for the average Indian? Yes, sir, on the face of it, it means that, you know, you will spend more for the things you need. But what does it do to futures? What does it do to families and their plans for prosperity? Well, as I said, it, I mean, high inflation eats into your purchasing power. So if you're expecting inflation of 5% and you get inflation of 10%, 5% of your purchasing power has been eaten away, right? So at the end of it all, partly you have to say, okay, these are difficult times and we have to grit our teeth. What can the government do if the government does provide free food? I mean, that I think is extremely important. If, if uh, all the vulnerable people are getting that this 25 kilos of free rations, that an, amounts to a huge subsidy to all households everywhere. And that amounts to a very significant reduction of the distress that we are going to feel. But let us not pretend that when the whole world is suffering from distress, that we are going to escape this distress. We are also going to suffer.